Well, welcome everyone to the Engineer Whisperer podcast. Today we're doing something special, and this is episode two of a four-part podcast series, and we are doing it on a book called Leadership for Engineers, <clears throat> How to Turn Perfectly Good STEM Professionals into Management. I'm super excited about this. My friend Mike wrote it and I encouraged him to do it and he did it and I want to promote it. And that's why we're here today in episode two. So that's how it looks. If you haven't gotten it yet, I encourage you to go out and buy it. And let me just tell you a little bit kind of where we are. So in episode one, we talked to you about leaning from engineer to manager and that transition uh, and the successful transition from an individual contributor into a um, leadership position. Today, we're going to talk about the often missed tools of leadership for STEM professionals. I'm super excited about this one. And then in episode three, we're going to focus on fun with people. So the fine art of managing people. I know you're all curious of how you do that. Well, we're going to tell you. And then we're going to close with episode four, surviving and thriving on a personal level as a leader. Don't miss any of the episodes. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. And so let me bring in Mike. Mike, welcome to the podcast. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me back. Of course. So for those who haven't met you yet, give us a little bit brief intro and then what you're up to. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I will uh, keep it light, but uh, born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and, and uh, got an engineering electrical engineering degree from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Went on to work around the Milwaukee area and, and uh, was fortunate to have grown into executive leadership in my career, I uh, spent three decades plus with uh, the final company I worked for uh, in the supply chain automation field. At the end of my career, I was responsible for a $300 million P&L and had 800 and some people working for me. And uh, it was a tough, it was a tough slog. So I uh, built a bit of a database along the way, took some good notes and turned that into a book to help other people, specifically to help other people. And this podcast is a sampling from that, hopefully bring some value, but also hopefully entice you to to, to participate more and, and learn more either from the book or, or from a class I've got coming up. Yeah, tell us a little about the about the class. Let's remind folks who want to learn more. Oh yeah, yeah, good 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 segue. Let me let me uh, share my screen if I could here, and uh, I will uh, let the group know. Uh, I am fortunate to have been invited to be a teacher at the, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee School of Continuing Education. Uh, it's in in Milwaukee, and I'm doing an online and in-person class May 15th through 16th. So if, if you like what we're talking about, uh, whether you read the book or not, if you like the subject matter and you feel there's some value for you in uh, helping you take the journey from individual engineering contributor to managing other people, uh, this is a two-day class, 12 hours in total, six hours a day. It's going to be worth 1.2 continuing education units. Uh, and you can look at the uh, the, uh, the website at the, the School of Continuing Education. I think you'll find it pretty readily. Uh, if not, later on, I'll give you my email address and I can point you in the right direction. But uh, it's going to be fun. It should be exciting. Uh, and it's a great school. And it will give you a pretty deep dive into what we're talking about very lightly in these podcasts. Yeah, yeah, and you still have time to sign up, so it's next month. Right, right. Yeah, you got about a month yet. Yeah, so let's get going with episode two. So today we're going to talk about the optimist tools of leadership for STEM professionals. So let's do a little recap from episode one. So in episode one, last time you convinced us that uh, engineers have this raw material to become effective leaders, and then we showed them kind of how to think through that transition. Well, this is all good stuff, but what about now let's enter episode two. What about some of the significantly missing skills and experiences that could challenge them? What was something in your personal journey that you can share us about? Share us yeah, a little bit we'll, about. We'll, 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 we'll touch on a handful of them and I'm not going to go super deep, but I, I want to entice the group to learn more about some of these things. The, the first one I want to mention is 
one that I really struggled with, and that was time management. Usually, as an engineer, you have a pretty defined course of action and a schedule and a budget, and you you do a sequential set of things to accomplish a particular goal, whether it's a design, a software program, uh, uh, a, a new product introduction, whatever it might be. Uh, in leadership, uh, it, it's a machine gun. It, it's like a, a, a 120 volt a tennis ball launcher coming at you at 240 volts where you've got just uh, just one thing after another unplanned coming into your world so time management can be a source of stress wait do you a have a visual of... for us you always have great visuals I, I i do i do as a matter of fact yes thank you um it, it can be a source of stress or it can be a, a source of uh energy that that you that you propel or a source of coordination for your time uh, let me let me share with you some laws about time and uh, how to violate those laws. Like for example, and these these are things that are truisms that I would encourage you to try to work around. Like leaders will respond to emails while sitting on the toilet. What I mean there is you'll be multitasking. You will you you will give up segments of your life. Uh, that you wish you hadn't, there'll be some regret, some resentment maybe because you're putting so much time in. One of the best things I did was I literally took out a number two pencil and I wrote on a piece of paper, here's the time I'm willing to give the company. I'm willing to work 55 to 65 hours a week, maybe one weekend uh, a month, and I'm willing to travel every other month, every other week. Now, sometimes I went over that, sometimes I went under it, but at least to put a box around what sacrifices I'm willing to make without resentment. Yes. Uh, so so if, if things went bad or I had to do a little bit more, as long as I stuck to that for the most part, I, I had no kick coming, as my mother would say. You've got no kick coming. Uh, the, the other truism is leaders see an opportunity for work before anyone else does. You, As you get higher in the organization and have more responsibility, you'll see all the things that should be getting done that either aren't or aren't getting done fast enough. And, and it will drive you out of your mind. Um, but be, don't ever forget if all you have to give the company is more of your personal time, shame on you. I've known leaders that work themselves literally to death. Uh, and uh, they just kept giving more and more and more time to the company thinking that they were so good and so important. That yeah. was the answer that's not the answer. Uh, yeah. I, I hate to use an old phrase, work smarter, not harder. Uh, but th that's the case. You, you just, you just have to draw that line and, and, and put some boxes around it. The, the other truism is it's easier to do it yourself, particularly if the folks in your organization are doing what you used to do. Could you do it better and faster? Probably uh, at least early on, you could probably do it better and faster. Don't you dare. Don't you dare. You, you, you need to empower, measure, coach, inspire those people because if you're doing it, uh, they're going to be doing something else, uh, which uh, isn't towards the mission, like mixing bleach with ammonia. They, they need you as an inspiration and a, and a, a mentor, uh, not as a doer. Uh, this, this next one is a tough one, particularly it's around time management, but it's also around vision. And that is leaders have a crystal clear image of what perfect looks like. I had a, a vice president working for me that uh, was a, a perfectionist and he could no matter what he was looking at he could see what perfection was and he would he was completely intolerant of anybody doing something other than his vision that's horrible it, it's horrible when yes you might be able to see what a perfect solution would be for this or a perfect approach to expect other humans to do that just because you see it is unfair to them and is demoralizing so yes don't don't waste a lot of time on that uh, leaders are world-class multitaskers. They have 15 things going at once. No, you're not. You're, 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 you're toggling between this and that and this and that and probably wasting time doing the toggling. Yes. Uh, nothing is more powerful. I had a client once say to me, Mike, I'm going to finish this phone call and then I'm going to give you my undivided attention. Y you never hear that term anymore, undivided attention. It was spectacular. If you can just say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it extremely well. With with it's going to be meaningful and focused, and then I'm going to move on to something else. Easier said than done. I, I fully appreciate that. But those people that think they're multitaskers 
are probably doing a B minus job on six things at once. Yeah, don't kid yourself. I think that's what also you're saying. Right, right, right. Yeah. You're just as human as everybody else. Exactly. And and it, people can tell when you're giving less than 100% of yourself on something. Oh, yes. Right? They, they, yeah. they know that. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the final misconception is everything is important in leadership. Uh, if you got, you've got this, this large stack of to do's thing to do things. And, and the key really is prioritization. And, yes. and this is a little bit of an abstract here, but, uh, the, the way I prioritize is define my mission and then determine how distanced this task is from my mission. If my mission is to increase sales in the organization and I'm working on, um, you know, some Excel spreadsheet for the baseball game this weekend or something. That's a long distance from my mission. Yeah. So my goal in this graphic here is that you might have some quick wins that you can knock out real quick. If they're not aligned with your mission, go to the ones that are tightly connected to the mission at hand. Don't forget what that is. Prioritize those first. Chest pain and customer problems are way more important than updating the intranet. So prioritize based on yeah. uh, the, the true importance being one over that distance from the from the mission. Yeah, I mean, it's a good sign if you don't know how far you are from them. If this task, how far is from the mission, that's a sign that probably it's not that important. Exactly, exactly. You just ask yourself. I, I used to say for a while I had a, a, a group of uh, proposal writers, engineers that were proposal writers, and we were very low in incoming revenue. And I said, guys, guys and girls, uh, if anything you're working on isn't to generate a proposal, you're working on the wrong thing. So don't, we, there's there's 50 ways to spend your time. You got to really put that through a funnel. Yes. Uh, so uh, th that's to, to me, that's the, the 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 key to how to spend your time and and really to, to move into a high prioritized, high focused uh, use of time management. Uh, the, the, the the last thing I want to mention is uh, this the constructs of mission, vision, values, and uh, it, it's it's related to time management, uh, but it it is another important tool to understand. And it's an they're, they're overused constructs. You hear people say, "Oh, mission, vision, values." And, yes, yeah, it's all yes. it's all worn out. Yes, they're dated constructs, but they're hugely valuable. Let, let me just walk you through the architecture of those constructs and, and hopefully you will see how they can really be a value to you when you, when you uh, craft your organizational mission. So the, the mission is what we do. My, my, our mission is we make donuts. We are, our, we, we are a donut company. We make donuts. Our vision is to be a craft bakery, a, a local craft bakery with artisan products that are high priced and high margin. The strategy on how to get there are what's the overall thing we're going to do to achieve that vision. It's the big idea. And maybe the big idea is we're going to employ grandmothers around the city to create this craft bakery. The strategy drives the key initiatives. These are the one, two, three, four big chunky things we have to get done in order to realize that strategy and realize that mission the strategy drives they're not they're not who what when where why they're just big things we gotta go go do we gotta we gotta we gotta think about a facility we gotta think about a hiring plan we gotta think about uh, a menu those are the big chunky things mm -hmm. the tactical plan is the who what when where why that drives those initiatives okay we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna build a bakery there's 15 things you got to do to build a bakery. So those are the oh. tactical plans yeah. that drive those initiatives. Uh, that's what's referred to as the operating plan. Th this, this development of an operating plan is core to the core of leaderships, leadership. And if you're an engineer moving into leadership, uh, understanding that, and, and engineers love detail, they love uh, a structured plan, that's what's in that box and that's what's going to make you successful is building, be, being able to build those operating plans. Be, the behaviors outside of the plan is, are the, the things that people actually do, functionally do, how they do them, uh, how we do what we do in order to accomplish those tactics. So 
am I doing it equitably? Am I doing it sustainably? Am I doing it mm. uh, inclusively? Uh, am I doing it uh, methodically? Those behaviors are the soft side of accomplishing the tactics. The, the, hopefully, as a leader, you've crafted some core values that everybody has tattooed on their left forearm, and they know don't behave outside these values. So if our value is, let's say, for example, um, empowerment, I'm going to I'm going to uh, push work through the organization so that people feel they're in charge of their goals. If that's a core value, behave that way so that the plans get accomplished that way. Uh, so the behavior should be driven by core values. Uh, this is a real misnomer by people, and and I, I can't say this how important this is enough. Y you've all heard how culture, organizational culture is vital and building a culture that is positive and sustainable and so forth is, is vital to success in an organization. You can't dictate what a culture is. All you can do is behave a certain way and that behavior dictates the culture. You can put a poster in the lobby and say, we, we have a culture of uh, happiness or a culture of uh, fairness. You can say that, but doesn't matter until you behave that way. So mm -hmm. it's the behaviors, and I know this is this is a bit abstract, but it's those behaviors that drive the culture. It's the it's the things that people say about you because of how you behaved, and that culture wraps around your mission and says we are we are a bakery, we are a donut company, but we are also one of the most fun donut companies you can you can go to. Does that make sense, Andrea? It does. It does, and I'm happy that you're that we are spending some time on it and kind of putting it on the paper and making it visual. I know engineers love visuals as well, so I, I think it's good. It's good that you brought it up, that you write about it in the book, that we talk about it, because it is key. It is key to understand these these subtle differences between mission and vision and strategy and culture and poor behaviors. Um, Cause these words are, are gonna come at you once you move into leadership, these business words are gonna come at you. And instead of looking blank at someone who tells you about them, uh, understand that these are some things that you have to learn about and get out and learn about it. So that's what you're doing right now by listening to Mike. So thanks for being here <laughs> and uh, yeah, I this this visual is going to stay with me. It looks really cool. Well, and, and I think the other part of it is, particularly in in entrepreneurial situations, uh, you know, the, the the Zuckerbergs of the world or whatever. When they when they first started, you got to wear nine hats. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how big this thing's going to go. I don't know where I'm taking it. But we're just going to show up at work every day and and do things. If you can be an engineer and compartmentalize like I have on this graphic and say. Where are we? Where are we going? What are we doing? Who's doing what? Who's accountable for what? How do we measure those things? Uh, how are we going to behave when we're doing them? It, it, you don't necessarily need to write a book around it, but you, if you can at least craft the generalities, you, you, you will have some direction. And most importantly, the people in the organization will say, yeah, I know where we're going. I, I, know, how, I know how we're going to get there. It will come, the time will come when you need to have the answers to this. And even if, as you said, you know, the Mark Zuckerberg, he probably chose to come to work happy. So if nothing else, he chose his core values. Like, okay, I want to have a fun environment and maybe I know the vision of where I want to go and then we'll figure out the rest. But they've figured out, you will figure this out in between. And I think that's another key that along the way, all these are going to be figured out. Now, if you're in a big company, like a, a large company, um, corporate com company, some of these are already figured out for you. So you don't have to. It depends on where you are, where you're starting off as, as a leader. But just be aware that at some point, these all going to show up along your journey. So Right, right. We're showing them to you right now to prep you in that transition because that is what our behavior <laughs> intention is. Well, Mike, let's say that people get it that, okay, time management is important and okay, the mission and vision and blah, 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 all the other stuff is important. But what is, if anything, a profound mindset shift that engineers have to adopt in order to be successful in leadership? 
Yeah, I, I mean, if, if you look at this, it's all about driving change. Le leaders have to do a number of things. They have to inspire people, make decisions. We talked a little bit about decision making in the last episode. Mm -hmm. But uh, as evidenced by this slide, to get from where you are to what you aspire to requires uh, driving change or change management. And there's books and such written about change management and how to do all that. Um, I'm going to distill it down, if I could, to just something real simple. How do you get from A to B? And and don't lose sight of what's on the page here. But uh, if we if we think about going from A to B, let, let's take an example of manufacturing efficiency. Uh, how how much productivity we get out of the workforce in a manufacturing plant? There's a historic there's historic data from from this moment prior. So. The historic data, which I'm calling number one here, is manufacturing efficiency over time from some time in the past up until now. My, um, there's going to be some erroneous elements in that history. For example, the pandemic. Okay, let's just say uh, the, the pandemic infused a certain amount of capital because of uh, PPP or whatever it might be. You got to throw out the outliers and come up with a general... Yeah. Uh, momentum, a general trend line from what history has taught us. That's point A. So right now we're at point A based on the history we've had so far. And then if I do nothing, if I just keep doing what I'm doing, I can mm -hmm. extrapolate that and say, you know, in three years from now, I'm going to be at A prime. That's going to be my extrapolated end position if I do nothing more than I'm doing today based on historical data. Yep. Uh, so if Instead, my shareholders, my stakeholders, my owners want to go to B. They want a manufacturing efficiency that's up here uh, at, at point B. How do I get there? Th that's change management and, and affecting a difference. If, if we as leaders weren't responsible for making things better, they wouldn't call us leaders. They just call us members of the organization, right? We wouldn't be. Oh, I love that. Yeah, I love that distinction. Yes, comes yeah, with responsibility right. to be a leader. Right. You, you got to make things better, or or if, if I'm not making things better, you really don't need me. And I'm not having any fun. If 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 it's just to get the A prime, I could probably do that with an arm tied behind my back. But yeah, that's when some engineers say, "I've been doing this job and I can do it." Yeah, with my eyes closed. Yeah, you, you got to break glass. As I say, you got to break glass. You got to upset the apple cart. You got you got to do things differently. So now my goal is to get from A to B, uh, not A to A prime. There's a gap there, though. Uh, my my organic growth takes me to A prime. What do I do? That's where you craft linear thinking. What are the what are the mm -hmm. vertical steps I need to make along this journey to incrementally get me to B? Uh, and and back to the previous slide. That's where your initiatives and tactical plans come in. Should be oh, yeah. relatively easy for an engineer to say, I got to do five big audacious things. And each one of those things is going to have a detailed owner, a tactical plan, expected results, a schedule, a budget. Uh, and that's, that's what becomes your operating plan. I know it's a little abstract, but, but stick with me on this because it's, it's an important distinction that one of our jobs as leaders and not necessarily natural for all engineers is making things better, getting getting that linear thinking from A to B. Just to recap, document historical metrics. Uh, I, I want to correct for any erroneous or non-repeatable events, take out the outliers, establish a trend line to, to find where would I be if I did nothing, uh, extrapolate to that, that's my organic growth. Uh, and then figure out, okay, I got to be crystal clear. What's my objective? Why is it there? Is it attainable? Is it demoralizing? And then develop that operating plan uh, to, to get that from, from A to B. Well, I mean, this sounds all good. We said we we're going to show us how to be uh, someone who drives change. So right, right, uh, right, how does right. the picture, the pieces of the picture come together? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean this 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 process here is one where it's all about eating the elephant in small bites. You know, they uh, like someone might say, "Oh, how can I, I possibly get to to be?" There's there's no way. Uh, you need to put together a bridge. You need to say to yourself, "I'm going to uh, uh, build a bridge that says 
if I can sum all these discrete activities, maybe have a little contingency built in, uh, I will I will build a bridge to getting to, to that B point uh, using my team, using the resources I have, maximum utilization of available resources, as they say, um, and, and uh, it's accomplishable. But uh, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself as leaders, engineers becoming leaders. Our job is obviously inspiring others, coaching, making good decisions. But you got to make things better. You, you, you need to you need to lead the lead the army to success and, and improvement, continuous improvement. Oh, I see. So it's a little bit about reframing. That you said, even just understanding that if you do nothing, then your default is what you showed us, the A line. But then changes will show up in you now the requirement is point B. And then then it's becoming your responsibility to figure out how to create that path to from point where you are, call it point A now, to point B, which is the change, and then how you introduce it to everybody else so that they will get on board with your mission. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, got right. it. And that's yep, when yep, that yep, linear you gotta, you gotta thinking... Get, your, your point's well taken. I mean, getting buy-in is pretty important. And if you say we got to climb this giant mountain in a snowstorm. No one's going to buy in. But if you say, and here's the nine steps we're going to do to get there, we're, you know, we're going to, we're going to do some training. We're going to buy some equipment. We're going to get a coach. We're going to get a, what, uh, th then they'll go, Oh, okay. All right. I, I can eat that elephant. Yeah. Yeah. It's those steps are very important to put those together and figure them out. I, right. I can see, well, I love it that we're starting to talk in business terms and, and, um, you know, business lingo, because as leaders, you gonna be exposed to it. So let's introduce this other lingo, the the financial aspect of it. You know, um, that might be something that engineers think, okay, that is totally foreign for me. Like, you know, finance and talking money is, is, is something that, you know, I didn't go to school to study that. So in your experience, um, what can engineers do about that? Yeah, that that I'll be honest with you. That was probably the toughest one for me. And I I, I did like I, I think I mentioned earlier. I took some a la carte uh, classes in order mm -hmm. to fulfill some of those gaps. Um, you, you can do calculus when you walk out of college. You can you can design things when you're in a working environment in a in an engineering role. But give somebody a balance sheet. Give them a profit and loss statement. You know, give them a cash flow analysis. Their their eyes are going to roll back in their head, and and they did for me. I really struggled with that. I was a I was a above average engineer, but I I knew nothing about the financial side of it. So, um, let me let me take you through an extremely high level fictional example of how business works in a company. And and there's there's a lot more to it than this. This is a really distilled down model here. Um, sure, just but... give us a taste, just so. Yeah, we have yeah, some just, understanding. Right, right. So, so no, no matter what your business is, whether it's private in the private sector or the government sector, whatever it is, you 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 have a customer. Even if your customer is internal to your organization, you, you have a customer that relies on what you do for a living. So, let's just take an example. Let, let's just say you, you, your your son Kevin is selling stolen cigarettes. He's got a a, a truckload of uh, cartons of stolen cigarettes that he bought. Cheap. Why stolen cigarettes? Because uh, anybody can sell legitimate cigarettes, but the stolen ones are the oh, ones that, they have higher margin. They have higher margin. So got it. So uh, this could this would be a distilled down profit and loss statement, or or also called an income statement for Kevin for a given month. Let Let's say he sells three thousand dollars worth of stolen cigarettes. That's how much people bought from him. Let's yeah. say at the high school, and revenue is how much he delivered. In this case, he delivers right after he sells it, so there's no gap. But in some companies, you might get orders for things for big projects, but the revenue you incur in a given month is a subset of that. But in this case, he he, he sold three thousand dollars worth, and and he delivered that much product. He paid two thousand dollars for him because you always want to make a buck, right? So yep. there's this guy named Josh who actually did the stealing. Kevin's just the fence. And and Josh sold the cigarettes to him at two thirds of what he's selling them to the general public. So at the end of the day, he makes a thousand dollars. That's called gross margin. That's yeah. that's the money left over after you sell what you either bought or made. 
in the case of Amazon, they don't make a lot of stuff. They just resell things. In the case of Ford Motor Company, they sell that which they make. Cost of goods sold for an automobile is that which it took to build that car. Yep. At the end of the day, Kevin's making 33% gross margin. Not too bad. I'm sure his parents are very proud of him. Uh, he, he gets to keep 33% <laughs> of what he's done. Now, the game's not over yet, though, because you've got expenses. Yes. SG, SG&A, is, uh, as they call it, is selling general and administrative. That's all the expenses in an organization that did not go into the product. So in Ford Motor Company's case, that's the salespeople, the offices, the accountants, the human resources, marketing, all the things that really didn't go into the car. You mm -hmm. gotta pay. You need them, and you gotta pay for them. So, in Kevin's case, uh, he's got a car payment because that's how he he drives his product around. Uh, he he probably smokes a little weed while he's working, and then he's got to stop at Chick Fil A periodically to to get some lunch. Those are all the expenses associated with his work day. At the end of the day, he he will cost four hundred and fifteen dollars in the, at the end of a month in expenses unrelated to the actual product at hand that he's delivering to the public. So his percent of sales is 14%. 14% of what he is taking in, he has to spend. So it comes out of gross margin. Yeah. When you take that out, you get, you get what you call operating income or profit of $585, which is about 20% of sales. So about 20% of the $3,000 he made that month goes right into his pocket. Now, in a in a large organization, you've got a thing called EBITDA, uh, earnings before income taxes and amortization. Uh, and, and, and there's more lines to this sheet, but you get the point. Uh, the, 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 the reason leaders need to be aware of this is, no, even if you're not in a financial role, everybody contributes to it. So you, you've got, um, again, I'm going to run through it real quick, gross margin, his fixed expenses, variable expenses, total expenses, what percent of his margin co comes out to pay for those things, and then what's the true leftover profit, uh, also called retained earnings. If you're, for example, owning a factory, those retained earnings, the company might use for something called capital expenditures, like I'm going to build a new, I'm, I'm going to buy a new stamping machine for my Ford factory so that I can make more cars next year. So they would take some of that $585 in order mm -hmm. to, to buy a machine to go into their factory. And then at the end of the day, you have what's called free cash flow. But th this is enough for now. This is enough to at least let you know that, A, you, you got to make money on what you, you, you have to buy smart or make smart. You have to make money on it after you've covered the cost of development for that product. You got to cover your ancillary expenses and then make darn sure that at the end of the day that, that the, the profit number is positive. Uh, let me let me share with you a couple of scenarios here. Uh, in in time, uh, those numbers are going to go up and down. You're going to sell more one month. You're going to sell less. And summer school comes or when there's summer vacation, maybe yes. kids aren't buying as many cigarettes because they're they're not hanging around the school. Kevin's got to take a cut. Uh, but your expenses also go up and down over time. So if you look at this graph. If things were on budget, let's just say for the first eight months out of the year, our gross margin is pretty good and our expenses are in line. Then all of a sudden something happens in the middle, like month 10 through 16, our expenses went up. I don't know, maybe he bought a new car and now his car expenses doubled. But for whatever reason, he's selling less product, whether he couldn't, he couldn't buy enough product or whatever it might be. Now his expenses exceed his gross margin. Now he's running negative profit, perilous. I've watched companies go out of business because they keep feeling like they're going to be able to pull out of this terrible scenario. Yeah. You, you, I'll give you some tips on how to be cautious of, of avoiding that. The other problem that occurs is when things are going really, really well and you've got low expenses and super high gross margin and you don't do something smart with that, that's another problem. That's a missed opportunity where... You could have got into a new business. You could have acquired a new machine. You could have put put a competitor out of business. Uh, but you instead maybe took that to profit and made dividends for your owners. So rule number one, make darn sure your gross margins higher than your expenses. And when things are really rocking, don't squander great results. Use those times to either 
uh, put a little money in the bank for when things get tough, or use those 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 glory days for doing big things and growing your business. Well, Mike, so I mean, this this seems like it's it's math, and I I think engineers know how to do math, yeah, and they've been exactly. trained in it. So it's just you know a little bit of reframing of you know from calculus to to <laughs> to these uh, um, you know income statements and balance sheets. So just how we call them that might be foreign to engineers, but otherwise you can use the knowledge that you already have. Um, I'm thinking, what do you think? Oh yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, it, it, it is math and it's, it's no, no different than putting up, putting a formula for any other product design or metallurgy. Uh, it, it, this is, there's a lot of, I'll, I'll, I'll use an equipment uh, analogy. There's a lot of knobs to this thing. You can turn up marketing, you can turn down sales, you can lower your price, raise your margin. Uh, so there's a lot of pieces and parts to it. That's what board of directors and executive management worry about every day and every night. But I, I want to just provide a fundamental overview of, of what we're talking about here. Uh, uh, the, the other element I want to share with you regarding finances is things are going to get tough. There, there's going to be those moments in business, whether no matter what group you're leading, yeah. there's going to be ups and downs. Yeah. And uh, number one, as an engineer who's used to nice linear steady state flow, don't be shocked by it. Uh, be prepared for it. Be able to react. Th th this is just a quick run through of the ups and downs in the company I worked for. Uh, this is this is a 40 year, 30, 30 year uh, time frame, if you will. Wow. Uh, in in the beginning, in the 80s, uh, computers became accessible. Our our whole automation industry changed. Uh, things were great, and we got into automated automating warehouses and distribution centers. Then on Black Monday in 1987, the the market crashed. Companies stopped buying. They stopped investing in supply chain. Then, lo and behold, coming up on 2000 was the dot com boom. People were building e commerce warehouses like crazy. We were rolling in it. Things were just fantastic. <laughs> dot com bubble comes along in in about 2000. Yeah. People said we're over capacity. We really don't need all this investment. Uh, and and the industry and the stock market shut down. Then Y2K came along, and a lot of people spent a lot of money on upgrading computers. We are a computer-based organization. We made a ridiculous amount of money uh, replacing old computers for, y, for Y2K reasons and selling uh, services and so forth. So the aftermarket business kicked in. Then 9-11 comes along. The mm -hmm. world freezes. No one's going to be investing. No one's going to be putting out RFQs for new equipment. 9-11 uh, stalled most industry in the world. We had a, a client, one of our clients had a catastrophe at one of their facilities that gave us a terrible reputation for a short period of time. We came back and we developed centers of excellence where we hyper-focused on individual markets and we really attacked the industry. Things went very well. Great recession happened in 2008. Again, markets in the, in the, in the dump. Uh, we got acquired by one of our number one competitors. Uh, we brought, we came back from that. Uh, automation became uh, premier, and all of a sudden, supply chains in the news. People are pouring money into e-commerce and more automation. Uh, then we decided to move our number one factory to Mexico, and we, it, it turned out fine, but we did it very poorly uh, and didn't educate people correctly in the beginning. Our company took a huge hit by a, a poorly managed move. Uh, and then I retired. Well, let me see. There, there, so there you go. So the line stuff. Right. Off. So, so uh, uh, eventually I, I retired and, and things were fine at the end. My point's not to talk about my career as much as all these things were on no one's mind in the 80s. Uh, those, those were things that just happened. Uh, uh, my advice to you is don't be shocked. Be prepared. Make sure you've got uh, the resources and the finances set aside to weather those tough times. Uh, and build an educational plan around that so you can you can be successful. W one way to do that is to uh, manage the P&L and manage your organization in tough times smartly. And, and this is my little one-page tip on how to lead through tough times from a financial standpoint. Number one, always have a fire extinguisher in the closet. Uh, when, when 
when you don't know yet what's coming and think about that graph I just showed you ups and downs, mm -hmm. make sure you've got a recovery plan in place that says, you know, if we have 20% decrease in revenue in a given quarter, we're going to have to do this, 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 and this. 40%, we're going to have to do this, this, and this, and this. It's much easier to do yes. those plan those difficult plans when you don't need them. So have a fire extinguisher in the closet. Act earlier than you think you need to and go deeper than you think you need to. And there's nothing worse than every week you've got a layoff. Every week we've got to cut costs. Every week we're taking the donuts out of the cafeteria. Do big things because there's momentum in spending and inertia in savings. Go go deeper than you think you need to and, and do it earlier. Beware of growth-based solutions. If if your company or your department or whatever you're responsible for is having a tough time, hey, if we hire three more people or take out more ads or spend money on this, we can we, we can recover. You, you're digging yourself a deeper hole. So you you got you got to look at that cost line that I showed you in the in the previous graph there. Yeah. You got to behave consistently at all consistently at all levels. If if you if one of your solutions is to reduce staff. Don't just do it on the shop floor. Do it in the indirect office as well and make sure that uh, you've made universal decisions across the organization. Uh, when things become really dire, and this is a tough one, uh, and you're in survival mode where things are things are really financially poor, you got to take big, big, bold steps. You got to close factories. You've got to uh, cut, cut off a third shift. You got to do things that are extremely difficult and in the last episode, we talked about how nice engineers are. This one's tough. This whole page is going to be tough on you. Yeah. Because you're you're optimistic, you're positive, as I as I've coached you to be, uh, but uh, it's going to be difficult. These are I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but I'm being realistic. These are some things you got to do when when the times get tough. Um, and then make sure when you recover, and you always will recover. Remember my little up and down graph I showed you there. And the optimism, back. right? Opti yep, yeah, optimism. Thank you. You're going to recover. They're going to recover. Exactly. But when you do recover, uh, don't go back to uh, eating. Uh, go, don't go from eating kale to eating glazed donuts again. My point is, uh, use those times to reset a little bit. Uh, I've got a friend who works for Caterpillar, and they have a very lumpy business, always have been. And he says, you know, it's the tough times that make us better. When things are really tough and we're struggling, we're prepared for it, number one, but it resets us to to smart, frugal behavior. And so use the bad times and the, and the tough times to uh, to accomplish that, to be uh, to be a better, leaner organization. Yeah, and there's that mindset shift. I've never waste a good disaster or never waste a good, you know, tough time yeah. um, because you're going to learn something you're going to learn something about yourself about the team about your customers about the industry and yeah i love that reset it's uh it's knowing how you're gonna bounce back not right. if you're gonna bounce back you know keep your optimism you're gonna bounce back one way or another and then understand that you have a choice you have control over how you're gonna bounce back and you now i love that you're sharing it yeah, I'm a big proponent to talk about the fire extinguisher, the if scenarios, the the uh, when everything goes wrong scenarios, when you're still in the good times, because it's just our mind just spins off um, into negativity the further we go into the tough times it's just harder to, to 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 think optimistic and to to come up with creative ways so do it while you're still in the good times get used to it kind of like expand that uh skill of yours learn it because it will come handy when the top that when the times are tough and just from your previous uh looking at your previous slide things will happen you know in um in our society, in our economy that nobody expected, nobody forecasted. I mean, just like COVID, who who knew that? And who knew that it's going to be the uh, for years and the impact of it? So things will happen. Don't stick your head in the sand. Right. Well said. Well said. Yeah, I mean, 
I, I know it's a, a a not fun topic, and it's I, I went into a little a little bit of detail here, but if I was giving a swimming lesson to a group of people, I would be obligated to show you where the where the life preservers hanging, right? So yes, th th this is my equivalent of yes. Yes, we have to lead an organization, and there's continuous improvement and growth, and all the wonderful things and mentoring. You you got to know where the where the life preserver is hanging, and and that's that's kind of why we went deep on this topic. Yes, yes. Well, let's pivot a little bit. So you told us about finance, and turns out that you know that's very similar to math. Now, what about some atypical, unnatural skills that engineers might require as they move into leadership? Right, right. Good, good question. I mean. Clearly, like I said, finance financials was a tough one for me, but that's a that's that's a learned skill. There's some that are a little there's a, there's two that are a little more uh, I'll call it challenging because it's close to the heart and and uh, can be emotional at times. The the, the first one is uh, selling. Uh, you know, m most engineers, the engineers I know, I know when I was an engineer. I, I didn't have a lot of respect or regard for the sales role. You know, to me, it was just kind of a glorified uh, position where somebody took an order and then I had to go do what they sold. I had to go deliver what they sold. But having been in the engineering technical ranks, project management, and also ran a pretty large sales organization, uh, I, I got to tell you, it's tough. It's, it's, a, it's a tough, brutal career path. And uh, when you're a leader, whether you have, whether you directly have salespeople working for you, or if you rely on the success of salespeople in your position, you should at least have a cursory understanding of what's involved. Um, you, you, you are in sales. And particularly when you get into management, whether you run a sales group or not, you're probably going to be more in front of customers than you ever were before. You're not going to be locked in your basement cubicle working on a program, you're going to be in meetings, at dinners, doing presentations. You're going to be selling internally as well. You might need to sell your that business plan we talked about earlier with the, with the um, yeah. initiatives and tactics. Yeah, you're the gonna mission. Sell, you're going to sell that. Mm -hmm. Yes, right? yes. You, you, you're going to build a plan that's going to cost half a million dollars in expenses. You got to sell that internally to make it happen. So there's there's internal sales and external. Yes. From an external standpoint, if you think about Kevin's spreadsheet, Kevin's uh, P and L statement, yes. If if that order entry line, the, the, let me let me talk in engineering terms. High sensitivity uh, to that order entry line. The the results are very sensitive. If if we don't book the work we need to book as an organization, uh, everything else goes red on you. So uh, don't don't ever underestimate the importance of that. Yes. When when you are in a leadership role, my advice to you is, particularly when you're new to that role, you can exploit your newness. In other words, hey, I'm the new gal that's yes. running this group, and you don't know me, Mr. Customer, but I'm looking for your advice. I'm looking for your coaching. What can we do better? That newness is invaluable, uh, particularly when you're talking to customers. Exploit that while you can. Uh, exhibit empathy. There's There's an old saying that uh, good salespeople want to sell a drill bit. Uh, really, really good salespeople uh, want to sell a hole. In other words, they understand the use of the product and are advocates for what the customer wants. Customer doesn't want a drill bit. Customer wants a hole. Yeah, the so benefits that, of it. Uh, yeah, but be empathetic to them. The really, really smart people in sales and in sales leadership ask the next question, what's the hole for? So, uh, I'm in the drill bit business. I'm going to help you put, put in a three eighths inch hole, but what are you using it for? Oh, you're using it for an aluminum fastener. Well, aluminum doesn't work well with steel. It's going to corrode. So let's, let's talk about a different approach, understanding them and being their advocate and being empathetic. Um, the, the other piece is establishing that top to top trust. When you're in management, you can call a senior person at the client side, again, internally or externally, and say, uh, you know, I'd like to have a conversation with you. How, how are we doing? Those are the kind of phone calls and discussions that people in leadership get to have and get those calls returned that you might not if you're a lowly salesperson working in a remote office. Yes. Um, likewise, when you're in leadership and have association with the sales process, 
know when to be absent. There are times when you don't want to be accessible. You want to be the person, you want to be the Oz behind the curtain where you're not necessarily involved in pricing, involved in the decision making. You've delegated that. Because if you show yourself as being the ultimate decision maker for the organization from a sales standpoint, they're going to call you and you're going to make a tough call. Uh, if you insulate yourself a little bit appropriately when the time is right, uh, that, that can work to the company's advantage. So just a little, little bit of sales management coaching there. Um, so the other, the, the last thing I'll leave you with is know when to fire your customers. If and, and consultants love four quadrant graphs, so I'm going to give you a four quadrant graph here. Um, if you can gr grade your client base based on the rewards they give you and the investment you must make along the way, and say to yourself, you know, uh, the ones that give me a lot of reward without a lot of effort, I'm going to smother them with love. The ones that cost me a fortune and I'm getting very little reward from, you know. I may have to toss them. The ones that are, eh, I don't spend much money with this client, but and they don't they don't uh, give us a lot of revenue. You you either can decide to separate from them or try to build a strategy to elevate them. And then the ones that are golden geese, where uh, yeah, you put a lot of time and energy into them, but they're imperative to your company. You you want to improve those relationships as well. So uh, th this this is these are the kind of decisions leaders make. Salespeople don't make these decisions. Salespeople see all these circles as being key opportunities. So in a leadership role, from a sales standpoint, you want to make objective, smart business decisions, never losing sight of Kevin's P&L statement. How, how do these customers affect that, that yes, P&L statement? What, what are they doing for me from, a, from, a, from an earnings standpoint? Yes, yes, yeah. So it's in a way, be aware that you're going to build trust and relationship with them. And also understand that there's going to be a time when you're going to have to make the, the decisions, the tough decisions, um, and it's going to be on your shoulder. So you know, right. prepare for it and build the skill for it. Yep, yep. Um, back to your question, though, the, of, of the things that are difficult emotionally or unnatural for sales folks uh, or for sales, for um, uh, leaders, engineers moving into leadership uh, the sales piece is one, and the second one that I th and maybe should be the first one. The, the thing that's most challenging, I find I found most challenging originally, uh, was public speaking. So uh, if, if you look at what people are scared of, uh, and and this is from the Washington Post, uh, people are more scared of public speaking than zombies. So uh, I, I know early on in my career when I was stuck in front of an audience, whether it's three people in a conference room or 500 people in an auditorium or a bunch of clients sitting around a table in a boardroom. Uh, it, it can be terrifying. It can be yeah. terrifying and it, it can be debilitating. But I got to tell you, when when you're in a leadership position, this is one you got to get good at. You, you, you got to get at least comfortable with it. You don't need to be an orator, uh, but you need to be at least comfortable looking people in the eye and saying, uh, I've got conviction. This is the way I think we should go. You got to present to your organization you got to present to clients you got to present to peers yeah so um it, it, this is one where you, you need to if you if you look at where you're going to be standing it, it it might be i mean I've, I've had hundreds and hundreds of people in front of or, or in my audience i've had two or three and if you can do it with conviction and positivity uh you convey the 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 sense of the organization you convey uh, persuasion. You can convey faith and belief in you. You can exhibit that that um, uh, integrity we talked about. But those are all different kinds of places where you're going to be very frequently uh, in front of others. So these are my few tips. And I would share these with anybody that's going to have to, whether you're going to be giving a eulogy or you're going to be uh, pitching a business plan or whatever it is. The, the, the number one thing that that helped me turn the corner is it's not about you. Uh, this is not a Toastmasters uh, meeting. It's about data transmission. And having a little bit of nervousness shows you care. If you get up there and glibly deliver uh, a, a presentation with, with ease, 
you know, it, it almost comes across a little plastic. So A, don't worry about how you're interpreted. It's about the data transmission. Your goal is to get what's in your head and on your materials into their head uh, and stop worrying about how they're grading you. Uh, don't emulate style. Develop your own over time. Strive to be a guitarist, you know, not one who plays the guitar. And the, and the, and the difference is there, um, provide music. Don't provide notes. Provide music. And how you do that and how you craft that over time, everybody's got their own style. There's There's people that are, spectacular at it and others that are clunky yeah but that comes with experience exactly comes with experience you you you, you gotta get you gotta you gotta have done it a few times you gotta have failed a few times and uh, it, it's a it's a learned it's a learned skill over time yes um it, it, it this is going to sound ridiculously academic but practice until you can't stand the sound of your own voice um <laughs> it, you you need to just you, you've all heard it stand in front of the mirror go over it's true. <laughs> you, yes. you know, if, if you don't, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I ran, you and I ran through this presentation uh, a handful of times. So you will be clearer, more comfortable, more believable if you've done it and you say to yourself, I can do this. I've done it. I, I can do it again. Uh, uh, one, one thing I always found fun, particularly when I was getting nervous, walking up to a podium, uh, I'd say to, I say to myself, hopefully in my head, okay, people, then you come up here and do this if you think it's if it's so easy. Uh, because they're looking at you in, in somewhat morbid fashion, hoping you stumble or wondering if you're going to screw up. Uh, stick your chest out, look them in the eye and say, okay, you, you, you guys come up here and do this. this is, but this they're is terrified. Yes, they're terrified. They're even more terrified to be invited to get up there. So, right. yes. Right, right. And, and something I love to do, I can't do it on a podcast, but I do it when I'm, when I'm meeting with a group, is say hi to the Romans as they enter the Colosseum. And, and what I mean by that is greet people as they're walking in the room. Yes. Hi, I'm Mike. Oh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm Audrey. Hi, I'm, I'm Aaliyah. Aaliyah. Uh, I'm Jerry. Just say hi. It, it demystifies them. It humanizes them. They say hi to you. They're probably more nervous than you are yes. uh, having to shake the speaker's hand. Yes. But at least you've touched some of those people and looked at them. And now when you look out there, you see their faces. They know who you are. And you, you've not, you're not looking at a wall full of uh, enemies, you're looking at a handful of people who you've said hello to. So yes. that, that helps a great deal. Great uh, point. Yeah. And, and you know, there, there's, there's two ways of leaving a, a public speaking engagement. One is, uh, you know, where you, you wet yourself, you're terrified, your throat closes up, you, you, wish, you, you, you wish you never got out of bed in the morning. And the other way is they're standing up and clapping. They're loving you. Uh, they're, 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 they're wishing you hadn't stopped speaking. Yes. Visualize that when you start. Visualize what what how great it will feel if when you walk down, they're just smiling at you, and they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna come up and give you their business card afterwards and say, "Man, that was great. I really enjoyed that." Uh, back to my my desire for optimism. Plan on that, and then make it happen. Yes. Uh, yeah. Kind of work backwards, like you said it in the previous episode. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Work, work backwards from the answer. And if the answer mm -hmm. is I did, I knocked it out of the park. Okay. Let's, let's work towards knocking it out of the park. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I'm so happy that you brought up communication and specifically public speaking for leaders, because that is something that we can all work on. And again, leaders will face it. You you gonna be put in front of people to speak, to sell your ideas, to sell your team's ideas, your team's proposal, to support your team that way. So yes, I think that it's um, it's a skill that once you start learning and then you you work your way up, it's gonna pay so many dividends. <clears throat> now, yeah. maybe to close up with, cause I'm looking at the time, uh, you know, from big audiences, let's move down to just the a smaller scale, like a one-on-one -on -one addressing your team. Do you have any tips for that? Yes, yes. Uh, we talked about group uh, presentations here, but um, let, let's talk about something that most humans aren't really good at, and it's only getting worse. Giving the technology, only getting worse, given the way technology is going. And I'm going to sound like an old guy here, but between texts and tweets and 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 short bursts of information and such, 
there there is an opportunity for an absence of clarity so there one of the best things a leader can be is immeasurably clear and uh there, there's there's a let, let's let's start with what can go wrong uh there's some communication error speaking like an engineer that can be imparted by the listener uh for example uh, if the, if the listener doesn't do a good job that's part of the problem with communication so uh here's an example a real life example uh, i enjoy a martini on occasion and i like a dry martini i don't like a dirty martini so I would go to a restaurant and I'd say, I would like a dry martini. And the, the waiter would inevitably write down DM. And the bartender would then make me a nice dirty martini. And I'd, yes. I'd get it and I'd take it back. i say, this is not a dry martini. It's a dirty martini. <laughs> so things get lost in communication by the listener. It's just drop out. Uh, the, the second is distortion, misinterpretation due to an absence of detail. So uh you take your car in for oil change and then you find out oh you wanted synthetic oil yeah you didn't say that you said you wanted an oil change we put in you know some junk uh, oh. um, cheap uh walmart oil in your in your car yeah so it, it, it was an absence of detail and the last one i'll call refraction where the listener twists the data a little bit to his or her benefit uh oh oh honey i thought you said i should just stop smoking in the house not stop smoking completely i misunderstood so you 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 have conveniently um refracted the message and uh that that can be dangerous so when i craft communication i think about these these things um so you think about the errors first of what think could... about the, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Right, right, Just... right, right, right. Think about the errors. Think about what could go wrong and mm -hmm. how can I be so stinking clear that there's no opportunity for error? I mean, I could literally write down, I want a dry martini, put it on a post-it, give it to the waiter and say, here, hand this to the bartender. You know, that, that's unrealistic. But uh, so, some facts here are leaders are required to give and manage direction. It's just what we do that's why we're called managers is is uh we we have to pass on goals and objectives if there's a way to misinterpret communications the recipient will find one it could be intentional it could be unintentional <laughs> yes your, your job is to keep them from finding one and, and i wish you all the luck in the world for example um let me move this here uh we'd like the results of your machine delivered uh, machine design delivered tuesday what, what's wrong with that Who's we? Uh, who, who are we? Uh, and, and we would like. What, what does like mean? Must have or we would prefer? Is it yes. uh, define results? Is it detailed drawings or just a, a thumbs up, thumbs down? Uh, when you say machine design, do you mean a pilot or do you mean just a set of drawings? When you say deliver, do you say can I send you an email or, or do you need a hard copy? And you said Tuesday. Uh, what time Tuesday? You need that in the morning. I, I got a spin class in the morning. A, a better way is uh ian moore the vp of manufacturing needs your final detailed final detailed test data from machine design and your final go live date recommendation in his email by noon on tuesday crystal clear yes and i know i'm belaboring a point that people are going to roll their eyes and say is fairly obvious but uh so many people spend so much time in leadership due to unmet expectations that very often can be thwarted just by adding a level of clarity, and I and I I think that's that's a, that's a pretty important distinction. Yeah, I think it was worth our time, Mike. This is to you know put it in there, squeeze it in because oh, I love what you said. People spend so much time and and energy and effort um, on oh yeah unwanted expectations. Well, and, uh, and resentment. There's there's those times where. As leaders, and I go back to that earlier comment I made where a, a leader can visualize perfection, you might you might know precisely what you're looking for, but if you don't take the time to be ridiculously clear on what your expectations are and your vision of perfection, there's going to be resentment. Like, oh my God, that person never gets me what I'm looking for. Were you crystal clear on it? Whose fault is that, right? So... Uh, again, putting a finer point on something that's that's probably a little broader, but uh, I think it's worth the time. Yeah, let me add just something that I work with with uh, the leaders that I work with is just because your role changed and you moved up the ladder, 
people still cannot read your mind. Mm -hmm. Nothing changes. People can't read your mind when you're an individual contributor and when you're a director, executive, VP, people still cannot read your mind. So remember that. And to your point, tell people what you want clearly, what your expectations are, by when, all those what you showed us previously. Mm, find the errors yourself and get better at communicating. Well, Mike, we are at the end of our hour again together, episode two. And um, yeah, Ooh, we talked again of a lot of things. So a quick summary of what, what we heard, um, you know, skills, those often missed skills, um, so important. Glad that you were here to hear them and hopefully you got some awareness and some work to do too. You know, I shamelessly say, if you have some homework to do, go do them. That is exactly why I wanted to invite Mike so that you get a head start, so that you maybe catch up, so that you change that point A and the default of where it's going in your development, in your leadership, and you create your own change management, not just for the organization, but for your own mindset and skills. So as we heard, mindset shifts are so important. Get on it, do the work. Um, the business concepts gonna hit, they're gonna hit you. Uh, don't let them hit you on the head. So that's my advice. And then, yeah, communication skills. Um, you didn't learn them in the engineering school. It's okay. You still have time and opportunity to learn them now. So find a course, Get go sign up for Mike's course that's coming up in May and um, give yourself that advantage in leadership, in your career. You have a choice. So choose to lead differently all right mike um oh yeah give us a little bit of taste of episode three what are we going to talk about next um we, we've talked about you know some tools and some skills and, and some general transition making in the first two episodes uh in three we're going to be covering more about the human side of things one, one of the responsibilities and it, it's an it is probably the greatest responsibility of leadership is that you are now accountable for other people and their career paths, their happiness, their success, their creativity, their 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 vision, their loyalty, all those things. And it's a del it's a delicate move for an engineer to be now accountable for all those aspects of the, the human. So uh, we're going to talk about fun with people, and it's going to be focused largely on the the human element and helping others succeed and bringing others to greatness. Yeah, I can't wait. Super exciting. Well, this is the book that we are reviewing here. So if you haven't got it yet, go get it. And then, Mike, if people want to connect with you, how can they connect with you? Sure, I'd be happy to, to respond to emails uh, and start conversations. If there's any feedback on this podcast or if there's uh, things you think I can I can help you with, uh, I can be reached at MK Tactical Leadership at gmail.com the letter m the letter k uh tech i'll spell out one word tactical leadership at gmail.com and uh, i'd be happy to hear from you awesome well mike thank you again for being here uh for having fun and i will see you during the next episode very good thanks for your time